Really looking forward to my talk with Steve Barber, the owner and CEO of Upstream Data Incorporated. Uh, I find this a highly fascinating project and company uh, which, yeah, I mean, utilizes the already existing resources, which is gas, uh, you know, stranded, flared gas, whatever you want to call it, uh, that would have been, you know, would, would be a waste or wasted or burned or whatever and converted to uh, energy, to Bitcoin mining. And this is what they do. They specialize, uh, Steve Barber, you know, with his company, Upstream Data. Uh, you can check it out on upstreamdata.ca. So I'm, I'm going to try to break this down with my questions, you know, basic questions like what is it, what do you do, uh, uh, you know, what's the procedure, what's the operation, what are the expenses, uh, what are the profit margins, uh, who, who, are, who are his clients. So, so Upstream Data specializes in Bitcoin mining at oil and gas facilities with modular, you know, portable, transportable uh facilities or machines, which, you know, you can just move from one place to another. That's so, so great. And all you need, you know, is a uh, internet connection or a satellite and, uh, you know, just really few resources. And of course, yeah, it takes capital expenditure, operational expenditure, but, um, you know, uh, you hear a lot about, uh, you know, environmental pollution, this and that, and, you know, there's so much wasted energy. And so this is, you know, prime example of in, from my perspective is, you know, you have uh, real existing, you know, uh, otherwise, you know, wasted energy that is converted or transmuted, transformed into into Bitcoin mining. Anyway, I hope you're going to enjoy this. Um, really looking forward to this. Um, really excited. And let me know what you think afterwards. And thanks so much for your support and for your for listening to my podcast channel to Bitcoin um, and to my, you know, general channels uh, of of uh, the Total Connector show. Thank you so much and have fun. Bye. Steve, welcome to the Total Bitcoin sh show. Uh, thanks so much for your time. It's really an honor, pleasure to have you here on my show for the first time. How are you doing, man? I'm doing good. Uh, is it Kevin or Kayvan? How do I no, say your name? It's Kayvan. Kayvan. Yeah. With emphasis yeah. on why. You know, it's a Persian name. So, yeah, it's a little bit. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, nice, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, uh, man. Sorry for being a bit elusive, but <laughs> no, we finally made it. Okay. Yeah, Steve. You know what? I, I heard about you like such a long time ago. I think it was even. I'm not sure. I think it, it's a Safed and a Moose made a public. It was a public statement. Since, you know, so I can talk about it. He was sort of, you know, really excited about your project, Upstream Data Incorporated. I'm going to let you, you know, do maybe a brief introduction, uh, especially for my audience who, you know, who've never, most probably, you know, or probably never heard of you. Um, but um, I think even he was so, um, like, interested or excited to have a skin in the game in your, in, in your company. But, you know, it's none of my business. But, but, but the excitement, enthusiasm was there. And, and I thought, Wow, that's a pretty cool project. I mean, now you know you can de-weaponize all these pseudo arguments that <laughs> you know, then oh whatever, uh, Bitcoin mining is so energy, cons you know, consuming is so centralized and environmental pollution and blah blah blah. So, Steve, please, could you introduce yourself and you know your path to Bitcoin, your vision, your passion uh, in connection with Bitcoin, and what is upstream data? Um, in you know like break it down what, what do you do what what do your clients do with upstream data thanks so much while i'm doing you know uh, some screen sharing for the youtube uh, audience to see you know uh where they can go on the, on your website thanks so much yeah no problem yeah safety uh he's my boy uh i really i really like that guy i mean i met him um i met safety um probably a couple years ago now I was at a, it was at a, he was in doing a keynote at a conference here in Alberta. And I mean, I followed him for a, quite a while, just like, you know, most people um, interested in Bitcoin. Um, he's got a lot of great ideas and he, I've always, I always sort of saw him as, you know, a lot of his ideas were similar to mine and basically what he says sort of resonated with, you know, what the way I think about things as well. So, um, I met him at a conference and, and sort of, we just hit it off. Um, and yeah, you mentioned, uh, yeah, he is a, he's a small shareholder in my company now. Um, which he, he publicly announced, I think it was on Pomp's podcast. Oh, wow. That's probably where he heard that. Exactly. Um, yeah. Which is funny because we had just like, 
I don't even think we had closed the deal yet. And he, <laughs> he was already talking about it publicly, which was funny, but <laughs> no, I'm, I'm really happy to have him involved with the company, even just from a, um, you know, he called an advisory role or, you know, he's in the background obviously, but I'm sort of honored to have him as part of the, part of the company. Um, so yeah, you're showing off the website there, Upstream Data uh, Inc. Um, so yeah, that's a company I've been growing. Uh, I basically bootstrapped it in, well, it was actually 2016 that, it was in 2016 basically that I came up with, I guess the idea to go forward with this business. Um, I guess my background, my, well, I'm an oil field engineer um, based in Alberta in Saskatchewan, actually, I live right on the border. Um, and so, you know, what I was, what I've been doing for my career for the last 10 odd years, just like any oil field engineer, I'm looking to optimize oil and gas facilities. Um, I'm very passionate about it, actually. Um, probably more passionate than your typical, typical engineer. I spend a lot, I was already spending a lot of my free time trying to develop new product. Um, so my background really, I was working for a big oil company um, out here in Lloydminster, um, doing well with that. Um, but I, I was really motivated to like create new products. It was actually more to do with pumps and stuff. And so the way I got into Bitcoin was as I was doing all this, um, I was trying to push these products with the company, but the company didn't really care for, I mean, it's an oil producer. They didn't care for like building tools and stuff. And that's what I, I like to do like design tools, like figure out what tools people like and figure out ways to make them better and stuff. I'm mainly talking about downhole tools like uh, pumps and the accessories that go with pumps and stuff like that. So I was, I, I'm very passionate about that side of the industry. I was working, working to, basically I was trying to work towards a career where I would design tools, uh, patent them, license them out, get passive income and, and sort of move on, build more tools. And that's actually what I was doing. I quit my job in uh, early 2016 to do that. Um, and I, I actually have been successful doing that. I have two products uh, I've licensed so far. But um, as that was when I for also first heard about Bitcoin, I quit my job. I had more free time in my hands as I was trying to just get this new business off the ground. and. That's when I sort of, I think, I don't know, I must have found Bitcoin on like Reddit or something. Um, somebody was shit posting on Reddit about Bitcoin or something like that, uh, you know, pumping it. And I was like, you know, this is, I got to figure out what this is. Like, I've heard about this before. Uh, I remember like probably the first time I heard about it, it was probably on some mainstream media outlet like CNN or something. And they were, they were bashing Bitcoin saying it's like hacker money and and stuff like that. I think it was probably back in like 2013 when it was really starting to uh, create a buzz. And like anybody, you know, I didn't even look into it. Um, so then what got me interested in it. So once I went on, I think, I think it was Reddit and I learned a bit about it, just like probably 99% of your listeners right now, you know, you sort of, you got to understand it better. So you do more research. So what really sparked my interest in Bitcoin was, I, you know, coming from the oil field, there's been this sort of long standing problem with natural gas, um, stranded natural gas. And basically you get this, I'm not going to go into the super detail unless you want me to, but the, the, the byproduct of oil production is natural gas. And especially in recent times, like the last 15 years, um, natural gas prices have been so bad that there's no money in like conserving it. So conserving meaning like getting it to the market. So people just dispose of it any way they can. And so they're paying people like oil companies are paying service providers to build combustion systems where they just safely combust the gas on site. Um, so that's like a flare stack or a combustor incinerator. There's a bunch of different products. Um, other guys are doing really wonky things like they're they're generating power, but just sinking the power into a load bank, like just generating heat to get rid of it. Uh, there's, there's all kinds of creative ways uh, producers have figured out how to dispose of the gas. And it's, uh, you know, it's basically just a waste. So 
you know, obviously, you know, when I was reading about Bitcoin and I was, I was like, this mining thing is just crazy. Like, what is it? Like, you know, people are just running computers, keeping a network in sync and getting rewarded for that effort. And it just takes incredible amounts of energy. It's like, well, that makes a lot of sense for oil field, right? Um, I mean, just think about it. Like how, the most, the vast majority of the world's energy is produced in oil field. If you look, there's like 95 million, I think it's average 95 million barrels of oil equivalent um, produced per day, which is way more than, it's like significantly more than coal um, and every other energy source pretty much combined, I think. I have a, I've got a graph on that somewhere, but it's, it's basically the majority of the world's energy production. Everybody needs it. Everybody uses it. Um, you know, you're, you're every, like, there's so many products made from like fossil fuels that people don't think about, like just, you know, almost the majority of the components in the average household is, is there because it's enabled by fossil fuels, you know, whether it's like, diesel, moving the ground, moving dirt work, uh, transporting the material, manufacturing, it's just everywhere. And so with this, with this, like with this industry and massive energy source, you get, and, and this is, you know, typical to any, any energy source, you're going to get some amount of waste. And there's a lot of waste in natural gas. Um, there's different, you know, I can get into cer certain applications, but the obvious one is flaring and that's the one everyone talks about. Um, not necessarily the biggest opportunity, but it's definitely the, it's, it's the most visual um, form of, of natural gas waste, like, or energy waste in oil field. You just see these massive flare stacks blowing like, you know, hundreds of millions of BTU <laughs> worth wow. of, worth of energy. Um, it's, it's actually an insane amount of gas is, is wasted. So, I mean, obviously, you know, Bitcoin miners, what do we like? We like cheap energy. And so um, oil field has certainly a, a ton of potential um, for future growth in Bitcoin mining. I've positioned upstream data to be, uh, you know, a service provider for this growing industry. So what we do, what we do specifically is um, just like any oil field service company, like we will supply the tools that the oil producers need to um, to utilize, like you know, to leverage Bitcoin mining as a way to um, mitigate their waste gas and monetize their waste gas. So it's not just mitigation. Like not not only do they get to conserve it, so meaning monetize it and actually use it for something useful, which is effectively the definition of doing something green is actually you know putting it to use. So not only get do they get this green aspect of Bitcoin mining, but they, they get to monetize that gas that they, that they couldn't um, before. And so I think it makes a lot of sense for oil field. And that's why, you know, upstream data, we're here to, we're here to basically build out the Bitcoin mines for customers and offer, you know, power generation equipment as well. Mm -hmm. What I find really cool is that um, it seems um, when I'm reading, you know, the description on your website, upstreamdata.ca uh, for Canada. So um, uh, it so this is mobile, a mobile uh, facility or how should I call it? Like a apparatus uh, that it's mobile, it's flexible. You can, you can like put it anywhere, right? Uh, yeah, like it's portable. So it's, it's mm -hmm. mobile, portable, modular. Like, I mean, the products I've listed on the website is, uh, is a few of the things that we've been building and selling, although I got a bunch of new stuff in the works. Um, that'll be pretty cool too. But everything we build is, is meant to be, you know, I, it's meant to be first and foremost portable. And I think that's very important for the Bitcoin mining space, whether, whether it is, you know, oil field, I mean, it sort of has to be portable. If you're going to be in oil field, you've got to be able to remobilize it to a new site. Um, but aside from just oil field, like we do service any, any Bitcoin mining applications. And what we do exclusively is portable. Um, we, I won't, I won't bother, um, you know, unless I had, unless the need was great, like I wouldn't bother trying to get involved with a, you know, somebody building out a massive um, facility that's sort of, brick and mortar, like it's just tied to a utility. 
Um, part of the reason why is I don't see, I certainly wouldn't invest my money there. I don't see a great future there for Bitcoin mining, but you know, portability is important because you got to be able to, you know, if you're on a site, whether it's an oil site, whether you're tied into a utility with a container um, and the container side of the mining industry is getting more and more popular. Um, but whether, whether it's utility or whether it's oil field, you know, you want to be portable because as soon as, you know, someone throws down the censorship hammer, you know, and they say, all right, oh. we're the utility, we're jacking up your prices because mm -hmm. we don't like you or whatever. Can I ask you, can I ask you uh, a Steve, I mean, does that happen often or sometimes or, or I mean, on a regular yeah, basis? Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say yet often. Um, it's definitely happened. Um, it's happened a few times that I'm aware of and, and probably many, many times that I'm not aware of. Um, so cases like, uh, well, Quebec, for example, Quebec, Quebec's a good example. Quebec, um, you know, they were in 2017 and 2018, you know, Quebec, Quebec, uh, Quebec produces a ton of hydroelectricity and they have a ton of surplus as well, just like any hydro plant. Um, and so Quebec was poised to be in a great position to attract a lot of Bitcoin mining investment. And a lot of people were talking about it. And a lot of miners did move to Quebec and, and set up um, pretty substantial facilities like BitFarms. Uh, it's a really great company here out of Canada. Mm. They've got uh, some significant size facilities in Quebec and, and I think they're doing really well. Um, so uh, they're, a big, they're a big company, but there's dozens of smaller companies doing it out there. Now what happened in Quebec though is, now I don't know, I don't know all the specifics, but they basically put a stop to it sometime in 2018 there. They, I don't know if they call it a moratorium, but they, they basically went from like a full 180 from being promoting the influx of Bitcoin mining to consume all of their, basically let's just call it curtailed hydro or just getting them like getting the, the getting Quebec and the hydro Quebec, um, the state, you know, the, the province of Quebec's, uh, energy arm, getting them, um, uh, you know, more revenue effectively for their, for their, uh, for their power than they, than they could get otherwise. But then for whatever reason, like reasons I won't speculate on, um, they decided to put a full stop to it and, and a, a minister in Quebec or whoever makes the decisions over there at Hydro Quebec decided not to take any new applications. There was a lot of miners actually, I know some personally who, um, you know, we're there in the process of building out facilities and, and, you know, like signing contracts and they got, you know, they got hurt a lot uh, financially. They had to cancel a lot of this stuff. They had equipment ordered, like some of their long lead equipment was ordered and, and, you know, that it's seriously uh, damaged. It certainly damaged the confidence in, you know, uh, going towards going to Quebec to mine Bitcoin. And I think that's going to, it's going to change like for the better in the future. So that's one example, like Wenatchee, Tech, uh, Wenatchee uh, Washington, I think, like that was a, a hub of mining as well. Um, another hydro, like utility-based um, uh, opportunity. And again, like they did the same thing. They, they basically stopped accepting applications. They jacked up the prices on existing miners. Um, mm -hmm. And that's the risk you take. Like if you're, if you're on a, if you're set up like a, a permanent, you know, you know, there's, there's a plenty of good reasons why you would set up a permanent facility. Like if you find there's you know, lots of examples of people finding old pulp and paper mills, uh, old like steel mills, you know, anything that already has the infrastructure that makes a lot of sense. Cause you don't have to spend a lot of money to retrofit it. You just throw your Bitcoin mine in there at very minimal upfront cost. So there's, <clears throat> there's definitely plenty of applications still to be had for that but the risk you take when you do that is you're at the you're sort of at the whim of, of the local utility the local politician whatever they decide um, will make or break your your business and um, you know like we're still in the early days of Bitcoin um, what we've seen in and, and this is just another reason why I always preach portable is because you know what we've seen in um, even the last bull run like up to 2017 and we see these few cases and there's plenty of other smaller cases I've heard of guys just um, being discriminated against for being Bitcoin miners. But uh, there's, 
there's a, um, when in that last bull run there, there, you know, there's a ton of investment, like many billions of dollars were invested in the Bitcoin mining in the future. Um, you can expect, you know, if we hit another bull run, let's say in the next couple of years and, and like all the past bull runs, it, it goes. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Like, yeah. And, and most of us that are listening, like myself included, uh, expect this to happen. And as it goes parabolic and you're getting absurd amounts of, uh, just absurd amounts of investment into Bitcoin mining, you're going to start seeing um, really like the effects on, let's say, utilities and, and grid based systems. Because um, one, one way like for people to think about it is, you know, like things have changed a lot. Like the, in, the industry's matured on the mining side. Um, you got you have like uh, like the ASIC, like the computers that mine Bitcoin. They're, they're becoming more and more commoditized. Um, so f years ago, like the amount of money you'd spend, if you, if you just look at the CapEx, like the amount of money you'd spend per kilowatt um, for Bitcoin mining was a lot higher than it is today. So earlier machines, they're a lot more expensive per kilowatt um, of power consumption, let's say a few years ago than they are today. Um, like an Antminer S9 right now, you can, you can buy them for, you know, 75 100 bucks us um for the for the complete unit like the the, the miner and the power supply and that does you know about 1.3 to 1.5 kilowatt and the newer hardware um is a little bit you know it's about twice as efficient now the prices are a bit higher because it's newer but there's a there's a steady trend in the cost per kilowatt declining over time as this hardware gets commoditized and so the point i'm trying to make is in the next bull run, when we see like, you know, tens of billions of dollars invested into mining, uh, that same capital, the, even if it's the same capital as the last run, it's gonna build out more hardware because the hardware is cheaper. It's gonna power more hardware. So you're gonna get more of a load on the system in the next bull run for the same capital investment than you have in the, in the previous bull runs. So, and that's going to actually continue to be the case. Like the more, the more the, uh, the hardware is commoditized, the less the CapEx per kilowatt um, becomes. And then, so over time for, for the same change in Bitcoin price, like the, if the price doubles and, and, the, and the CapEx, you know, hundred million CapEx gets pumped into the system, the hundred million in the future is going to power a lot more computers than it will today. So, gotcha. All right. And about the, uh, like, the, uh, um, I mean, you're going to probably talk about, but like operational, like OPEX, what do you call it? Like operational expenditure? Can, um, how, I mean, is, can you give a little bit details on that? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, um, <clears throat> the way I see it is, and I think the trends confirm this, like, so I was talking about CapEx, right? Mm -hmm. So CapEx over time is getting better per kilowatt. Um, cheaper and cheaper per kilowatt. Now the OPEX, I expect to go up um, over time. It's it's going to lag. Like it's not just going to be instant. It's going to take a lot longer. But you know, as as the and and the and the and the reason for that is if you have a hundred million dollars that's being invested into the Bitcoin mining space, before when most of that capex or most of that capital was tied up in capex, now it's going to go towards OPEX because the same amount of capital um, can for far less cost, build out the exact same infrastructure in terms of per uh, dollar per kilowatt. So then more money is going to be pumped, is, is free to be pumped into, you know, the, the OPEX, which is dollars per kilowatt hour. Mm -hmm. So I, I would expect, and I mean, this is sort of the, as things get more competitive. So let, let's say like all the easy pickings, right? Like that are still out there. A lot of them have been found, right? So all this hydropower, with, with like, let's say in the Sichuan province in China and all the Chinese hydro dams that were, like Ch China went out and built all these hydro dams that had no real demand, right? They, they speculated that they would have demand. They were wrong. They built out all these um, pretty large scale hydro dams um, all over China. Didn't have the demand for it. And some of them were just sitting idle, right? So these are obviously perfect applications for Bitcoin because they've already sunk the capital in the hydro. And at this point, you know, these, the P, the owners of the hydro dams are happy to just feed Bitcoin miners at extremely cheap power rates. Right. 
So these were all the lowest hanging fruit and that's what, that's what miners go after, right? The lowest hanging fruit. But, you know, in the next bull run, everybody is going to be wanting to get into those cheap, uh, you know, low hanging fruit facilities. So the competition is going to increase. And with that, the prices, right? So the, you're going to see, you're going to see like uh, these easy, like one, one to two cent per kilowatt hour facilities are going to go up in price. And, and really, why wouldn't they? Because if, if you're the, if you're supplying the energy, if you if you own that hydro dam, you're the, you're the, you're on the board of directors that, that owns that hydro dam and you've been selling these guys two cents power, but then, you know, mining has become so cheap that it's not much for you to just build your own firm. You're not going to sell it to them unless they pay you more money because else you're just going to do it yourself. So, so what you're going to see, what I expect to see is cost per kilowatt to continue to decline cost per kilowatt hour. So the OPEX to continue to increase. And so it's going to be more and more important to, um, there's going to be more and more need anyway for people to find uh, lower uh, lower uh, cost energy, so lower cost per kilowatt hour energy. And I think oil field will be there to fill that gap. Um, it's certainly challenging in oil field right now because it's a lot goes into an investment in an oil field mine, a lot more than what you would what you would see, let's say, in China on a hydro mine. And that's because you got to generate the power yourself. Like you got to you got to invest in the gen set. Um, you have to generate the power and the Bitcoin mine, um, whereas they just have to build out a Bitcoin mine for the most part. But there's other advantages, right? So in oil field, the advantage is you're generally helping the oil producer. So they should be willing to put some skin in the game, like maybe they, they supply the gen set or we have, very, we have varying agreements with oil companies. But uh, usually, we, like I only work with oil companies who I'm benefiting. So if it's our equipment, you know, I'm not going to be on their site if, if, you know, they're not appreciating my equipment being there. Like I'm not going to just set it up and pay them for the gas unless they put some skin in the game. Right. Um, right. So, yeah. I have a few questions. Uh, uh, what countries, regions, continents are, I mean, can you talk about like, are you, um, are you selling this? Um, uh, you know, so far we, so far we've just been in North America. So I've got mm -hmm. stuff in Texas, uh, Michigan right now. Hopefully, I got a few uh, possible deals in North Dakota, um, you know, like in, in, in the Bakken and in, and in a couple different areas like Kansas. I'm um, obviously in Canada. We're based in Canada. So Canada, the big opportunities in Alberta and Saskatchewan. Um, pretty big provinces generally, but in a really great place to be mining Bitcoin. It's very cold, um, great climate, uh, dry. Um, lots of dry natural gas like dry sweet natural gas that's that's sort of stranded and wasted and as you were sort of showing as i've been speaking here like some of the blog posts on my website i describe the opportunity in alberta and saskatchewan and beyond but uh, yeah that's basically where we are right now gotcha um uh, you 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 mentioned the the price per kilowatt hour uh, uh, is it true like the average uh, right now like is five cent per kilowatt hour is like is that like an average good price like you know across the spectrum um, well we can only really speculate on what the average is like there's certain um, mm -hmm. you have to assume things like what hardware is being used right. I mean, if, if everybody was using Antminer S9s, then it's pretty easy to sort of hone in on exactly what the average, uh, you know, price is across the network because you would assume they're shutting down when they're not profitable and stuff. But um, I would say five cents is uh, reasonable. Um, I would be a little uh, wary of investing into a mine. At, um, but... You know, I like, I mean, I know of people like just even utilities people that have like two cents, like two to three cents, and that's not going to last. Like, the competition will drive that up. But, um, in oil field, you can get much less than that. Um, you can get, you can get in some cases effectively negative. I mean, they're, they're, they're willing to rent and pay you to be there. Um, but, uh, the, the, off, the offsetting side of that is there's a lot more CapEx involved. So you might get, you know, you might build a, I might be able to sell my equipment as a rental and actually have them pay me to be there. 
Um, but uh, there's a lot of capital involved and there's, you know, there's operating costs, uh, direct, not just power costs. So um, I can't really say I have negative OPEX yet, but I do see in the future, I'm working on a few different products that will make our stuff a little more robust um, and give these guys a, a better, uh, better solution to what, to their stranded gas problems in which I do expect um, we can sort of get a almost like a negative operating cost. Right. How maintenance intensive is that? Like, um, um it, it, it's mainly the gen set, uh, the data center, as long as the data center is well designed. I mean, we've had, I've had some really like some of my products have just been running perfectly through multiple winters. Um, I've had a couple issues with new product designs that you have growing pains, basically, you might have some data center issues, but they can all be fixed, right? Um, so the stuff we've learned, um, you know, reintegrate into our next version of the product. And so the data centers, as long as they're being, um, um, generally, well, as long as they're being looked after, like generally they don't have a ton of problems. Um, they have very low maintenance. Like I have data centers I haven't had in any of our personnel out visiting in like three or four months. Um, usually it just sort of depends. Like it's usually the, the maintenance comes down to the gen set, like the, the power plant, right? You're running an engine, um, or if you're at a larger scale, you're running a turbine, mm -hmm. you gotta, you gotta maintain that. Right. So, um, the OPEX on the, excuse me, on the maintenance can vary. Um, mm -hmm. it can be, but it can be like less than even a cent Canadian. Depends on the gen set, depends on how well it's being maintained by the site operator. Um, depends on, you know, if it's a new or old equipment. Like there's a few a few factors involved, but. Right, uh, you know, like countries, uh, cause I'm originally, I was born in Iran and grew up like uh, seven years uh, and then the rest of my life in Austria and, and United States. But um, uh, Iran, if, if I have heard correctly, has one of the, or the largest gas reserves in the whole world so that would be like a no-brainer like <laughs> putting all those uh you know whatever you call it like modeler uh portable units everywhere across the country and you know make it usable make it workable um yeah it's like you know obviously right now iran you know people have been hyping the in, in terms of the bitcoin space they've been hyping the well, Bitcoin, obviously, the utility, uh, part of the utility of it is, is it does uh, circumvent, you know, censored uh, yeah, yeah. And capital yeah. controls. So, I mean, I heard about, there was that story floating around, for example, a few months back, like in Iran, uh, there was Bitcoin mines in mosques. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Do you remember that? Yeah. <laughs> that was yeah. So fun. And, and I mean, like, it makes sense. Like, if, if people are willing to, you know, if, they, if, they, if they're like us and they, and they think Bitcoin is, is gonna it's gonna stick around and be useful and 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 uh you know it's not it's more than more than purely speculative then i mean people in iran are, are there's opportunity there um you know to you to utilize bitcoin so if they have if iran has a ton of gas reserves and i have no doubt they do um they're part of uh you know the a few countries over in the Middle East that have a ton of oil and gas reserves. Mm -hmm. So they, they probably, they probably do. I, I, I don't know specifically, but um, although it's not, it's sort of like, you know, Bitcoin mining is, is there to serve a need. Like sometimes, you know, I've been approached by, uh, I've been approached by midstream oil companies, right? So midstream meaning they're not, they're not, they don't own the well, like they don't own the gas well, they own the facility downstream of the well. And so the midstream companies processing the gas and they're selling the gas to, you know, the utility or whoever's buying it off them, right? And so I've been approached by midstream companies. They've asked me like, hey, Steve, uh, you know, should we get into Bitcoin mining? Um, will you deploy, like will upstream deploy their equipment and pay us for the fuel? And my answer to the latter question, like, would we deploy our equipment and pay them for the fuel is no. Like, why would I do that when mm -hmm. I can just get cheaper fuel or have people pay me to take rid get rid of their fuel upstream, right? Mm -hmm. When you're when you're downstream and you're midstream or downstream, you're 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 past the point of what I call liability gas. Like you have gas, you have asset gas, like you have gas that is that is being sold. So like 
for example, Iran, just to, just using Iran as an example, like if, if we're talking midstream facilities in Iran that are already selling their gas at some price, I don't know what it would be over there. Um, you probably won't need to get into Bitcoin mining. You, you, the, the investment is better spent somewhere upstream where the gas is a liability. Um, oh, gotcha. Mm -hmm. But it also depends on need, right? Like it's not, it's not black or white. Um, if there's a need by those who would be investing in the mining that they, that it makes the most sense for them to do that there, then, then sure. Um, the need is different for every individual. So, yeah. You know, you sometimes hear people, uh, especially may maybe not now anymore, but I always heard, you know, from your friends like, okay, I'm going to start mining Bitcoin. I'm like, you know, you need a lot of capital expenditure, you know, capital. And um, I even heard Andreas Antonopoulos recently, I don't know what context he said, you know, you need at least like $50 million, you know, spare money <laughs> to go into this kind of business. So um, can you talk about like profit margin or what, what's the minimum requirement to go into, you know, bitcoin mining with uh, with with these kind of facilities like is um i don't think there's like a there's certainly not a you know black or white answer there mm -hmm. um it's very gray like so um you know i know people i know people like there's people that build out their little farms in a garage and they they max out you know the service they have at their at home like a i don't know it's like 100 amp or 200 amp it depend depends on what they can get with their utility and I mean, they're, they're mining at a, they're mining at a higher OPEX, like they're mining at a higher power cost. They might have great power costs, but it's still going to be higher, obviously, than, you know, if you spend 50 million uh, working direct with it utility, right? But um, their need for that coin might surpass the need of a speculative investment on a $50 million facility. They might be getting, they might value the Bitcoin that they're getting anonymously, like through mining a lot more than they would value it if they put that money into like crack and, and bought it direct. Right. right. Mm -hmm. um, then you got like, of course, uh, and this is always the case with any industry, but you got black market miners, you got, you got people that are literally, um, they just have cash to burn. Maybe it's through laundering that make, that makes Bitcoin a good investment for them mining, even, even if they're mining at a relative loss um, because it's better than their alternatives. And so if there's no real uh, straight answer on what, what is the minimum amount of capital you need or what is, the, what is the price you need, it's sort of a subjective thing. It's like, what is your need? If you're just doing it speculatively, if you're purely speculative, you're, just, you, you're an investment firm, you have a ton of extra capital and you're only doing it speculatively, let's say to get more fiat, to turn your 100 million into you know, 200 million in the shortest amount of time, um, you, then, then be, being purely speculative, then, then yes, you would just be looking at okay, cost of facility, like co like cost per kilowatt, and then and, and and operating cost of facility, like cost per kilowatt hour, and you have to be among the best in the world to make it work. Otherwise, you should just buy Bitcoin, right? If you you wouldn't mind Bitcoin mining is a long term play. You should not probably get into Bitcoin mining unless you have like world class opex or you think you got to at least think Bitcoin is going to go up in price um, that, or you have the best in class OPEX so that you can keep mining profitably when everyone else can't. So there's a lot that goes into it. I think I personally think a lot of money is pumped into Bitcoin mining that shouldn't be. Um, but who's, who am I to say that? Like, I think a lot of it, I think a lot of it is like coming from investment institutions that, you know, they, I don't, they really have not, not many, very many good options anyway. Like they have negative interest rates and low interest rates to, to work with. So they'd almost rather dump it in a, in inventory and in like ASICs and, and, and the facilities and real estate of Bitcoin mining, as opposed to, you know, it's more, it's, it's an easier sell probably to their, to those who make the decisions there, whether it's their investors or whatnot, to put it into these facilities rather than just put it into a digital coin and hold, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so yeah, it's sort of a complicated thing. It's, it's really just about need. 
Right. Uh, you know, um, while we're talking about it um, uh, today, you know, Marty Bent of, you know, Tales of the Crypt, he, he gives us this newsletter about, uh, I think the topic is sort of the, I don't know, I would call it like the thinking fallacies or the argumentative fallacies about the mining, the so-called mining death spirals. You know, people are are arguing like, okay, uh, like, okay, we, we got to say that uh, the hash rate follows price, right? So just to... Uh, make that statement right is that correct uh uh that hash rate follows price yeah is that correct to say or <laughs> um i i think that no it's not i think that but i also don't think it's correct to say that price follows hash rate okay i think they're uh you know i've said it before like difficulty and price are are anal like they're analogous like they're pretty much equivalent there's an equivalence there um, some money goes into mining anticipating price. Some money goes into mining following price. Uh, some, some people buy Bitcoin antis anticipating like improved, like increased uh, utility of the coin. They like to see the hash rate go up. They get bullish on that. Um, you can look at difficulty as a price because it's, it's, the, it's the energy price, right? The difficulty is the amount of hashes required to get a Bitcoin. Um, right. Like I publish a graph once in a while for a laugh on Twitter. Um, but it's, I don't really see anyone, anyone else publish it, but it's, it's the, if you take the total reward, uh, if you go to my media, for example, I got a lot of shit posts, but <laughs> if, you go, <laughs> if you go to my media section, just go to media there under right. my name. Oh, media. Yeah. Oh. It's right. Yeah. To the right. Oh, where are you? Am I here or where, where am yeah, I? Yeah, yeah, right there. You just you just put it, your cursor on it below. <laughs> yeah, I can't just see down. Media it... tweets and replies. oh, media. I'm sorry. But yeah, okay, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. media. Yeah, scroll down. Yeah, there that second graph. This one, yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> I got a lot of garbage posts. So let's ignore that. So uh, I, I like to I like to follow this. Like this is your total reward on the network. So all your, all your Bitcoins mined in a day, like subsidy and fees, mm -hmm. um, divided by the total hashes in a day. And the hash rate obviously is an estimate um, based on difficulty. So this is, uh, this is more of an estimate, but it's still pretty accurate. So this is the total um, Bitcoin per hash, but I actually just converted to dollars. So this is the dollar per hash, right? Um, this is really all that matters, but it, it just shows you that it's the ratio of like a price and the difficulty. And this is where we are. Like we're, we're seeing that the network, um, we're a little off topic, but this is where the network threshold is, is around like a dollar 40 us per exahash. So, um, the point on difficulty and price, I just see them as equivalent. One is trading energy for Bitcoin. One is trading, uh, whatever you value for Bitcoin. And we just use the unit of account is obviously dollars. So, oh, gotcha. So, I think um, the reason I'm, I mentioned that is that um, with your um, uh, the facilities, uh, the uh, you know the the, the gen sets or whatever we call, so you can actually you know let it operate without interruption. I mean, it doesn't matter whether hash rate goes up, down, price up. It, it just you know it just runs uh, without interruption, right? Well, yeah, gen, gen sets run pretty consistently. Like you can, gen sets will run for months at a time without any intervention. Um, now you should do oil changes on a certain, you know, you got to do some maintenance <laughs> on a certain periodic basis, right? But you can run them like three to four months with nothing, like no oil changes, nothing. And it's actually pretty amazing. Um, if, you, if you think about how many miles, like a gen set, you know, if it was in a vehicle, how many miles your vehicle would have driven in three months, running nonstop at 1800 RPM. Well, it's pretty, it's pretty amazing. So these things are like, they are pretty uh, reliable and consistent. Um, as for like, do I start stop hash rate based on price? Like, no, um, the answer, if I had to do that, I, you, if you have to do that, you probably shouldn't be mining. Um, my, I mean, I, we only run S nines, like we just run old stuff and it's for a lot of different reasons, like good reasons. But even with S nines, even though they're not that profitable, 
um, it still makes more sense for us to run that than invest in more capital, like more capital intensive equipment. Right. Because because it's the replacement, you know, of constantly this this constantly uh, re constant replacement of the you know uh, old equipment with the new equipment. That that is what is really, uh, you know, a really high expenditure, right? You got to be updated, like upgraded on a on a constant basis, is it? Yeah, um, it's true, and and it's true. Yeah, absolutely true. Like new equipment eventually makes the older stuff obsolete but um the people upgrading right now are mostly people um like either new investors right they don't have anything and they're just buying the newest stuff um but a lot of it is just the people with a higher opex right like the people that can't run s9s have to upgrade and my view on that is if you can't run s9s right now you probably shouldn't be mining um because you're probably missing out on a huge opportunity cost and just, you could have just put your money into buying Bitcoin and made, made more money. But, um, that's hard to say. Cause like I said, there's different needs. Like some people have different needs and some people it makes us, it makes sense for them to mine at 10 cents per kilowatt hour. As opposed to like us, my company is purely speculative. We're mining only for, for, for profit. Right. Right. Um, not for, not exactly for need We're, we're we try to service, it, the need comes from our customers. Like we, we work with customers who have a need, right? Um, but like the, when I talked earlier about the commoditization of these computers and, and how, and that's just going to only continue. Like, uh, you know, we had S nines come out in June, 2016. They, they're still profitable today for people like us. Um, the S 17s, which is the, the best, uh, bit main, at least, uh, chip and, and ASIC, you know, that came out in, well, I think it came out formally this year, earlier this year. Um, and that, uh, you know, that unit is like the S9 has lasted just about four years and it's going to, I'm still buying them. Like I expect them to last me, uh, especially if there's a bull run, then they just become more profitable again. Right. But they're going to last another year or two for some people. Uh, the S 17s will probably last seven, eight years before, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but obviously there's hardware failures, but like the actual efficiency of the chip will be suitable for many years. And it's just going to get to the point. I think we're getting to the point very quickly within 10 to 20 years, within 10 years, even like we will be at the point where manufacturers are all making equipment that is basically, um, the same, like from on nominal, like efficiency wise, it's all basically the same. They're going to have to start differentiating by making more reliable products and more versatile products. So like basically like an ASIC that can run in, you know, really hot and humid weather and maybe really very cold and, and dry environments, like just more operating range. So, so that would mean exponential efficiency then. I mean, yeah, I, well, it's like anything like the internal combustion engine has, you know, right. we've hit the wall, right? Like it, there's small improvements, right? Um, and, but, the, but, you know, we've, we've pretty much hit the thermodynamic limits on them without going with like really exotic materials, right? Um, so we're close to it anyway. And there's not, you don't see a lot of improvement in that industry. And I, I see the same with like ASICs, like, Look at the look at the television manufacturers right now. Like I, it was like Samsung just they, they like they just announced a TV that rotates like it's on a thing that spins. Like who cares, right? The next thing is like, it's gonna like holographic, you know? Yeah, shit. Yeah. So, <laughs> so you're seeing like gimmicks, right? So I, right. I think I think we'll see the same thing. But what I do expect to also see is. Uh, you know, ASIC manufacturers right now, they really only service the industrial market. And, and there's a good reason for that. Um, in the future though, as they're more commoditized and they have to differentiate and, and energy costs go up because of it's so competitive, I actually think, you know, they're going to actually move back to servicing home miners. Like they're going to, they're going to sell small, uh, you know, 120 volts for North America, um, 120 volt small ASICs that don't, that are quieter and less noisy that you can run at home. Um, it doesn't make sense to do that now because the industry is still maturing, but when it's matured, I think you're going to see a big market there. 
especially if they discriminate against the big industrial miners, because it's just going to open up an opportunity for home mining. Mm -hmm. um, I could swear I read something on your tweet mentioning individualized mining, like in 20 years, like somewhere on the roadmap or the vision that you've had, that what, what, what is possible maybe in 15, 20 years? Is that, uh, am I, am I mixing up something or is that uh, like, you know, it could be become much more accessible, like the individual mining in, in 20 years uh, time? Yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, I remember, I remember writing something about that on Twitter. Um, <laughs> Yeah, basically, like it's in the same line of what we're talking about now. Like the the commoditization, the increased opex, like the power costs for industrialized mining because through competition, right, is gonna make is gonna make it the let's say the the smaller commercial uh, hobby miner market a little a little more competitive. Um, you know, I've speculated that you know I, what I expect to see is besides the stuff I've already discussed, like you're going to see more, um, you're going to see like people building small devices that they can just plug into unmanned like power outlets. Exactly. Yeah. That's what I was talking yeah, about. Yeah. And steal, and, and steal power, right? Like yeah. the black market is going to yeah. get bigger. And you know, Steve, uh, I mean, it, not that, you know, it's not about like profit, but, but I'm like, this could contribute hugely to the decentralization if, if this is an issue. You know, like, like, you know, final, and we have the critical adoption rate. Everybody's, you know, like got a full node running. It's plug and play. You know, everybody's got the privacy. Everybody's mining. So, I mean, what more decentralization could we wish for? You know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm a huge, like, I've, I've been saying for a long time that, you know, Bitcoin gets more and more decentralized with time. Yeah. Um, it's like the same way like, about... Satoshi started Bitcoin and you had 100% centralization, right? We've, over time, we've gone anywhere but centralized. We've gotten more spread out, more decentralized. It's like, it's like the Big Bang, right? The, the universe started, or so we think, started in a single, you know, uh, single point or whatever, and it's been spreading out ever since. Uh, entropy is, is, by nature, goes from higher order to lower order it's a spreading out of heat right that is what's happening in bitcoin i th i think every sign points to that um there's been people a lot of people were fear mongering in the last bull market about bitmain being you know the majority miner uh being bitmain like bitcoin's too centralized look at bitmain they have all these pools that clearly did own like over 50 percent of the hash power i mean it was clear as day that Bitmain was a majority miner, or at least the bit like whoever, like Jihan and, and the guys at Bitmain, they had enough influence to influence these pools. And certainly that is true, um, but it's it's only been getting better. Um, and and as we see more manufacturing competition will increase increasingly get better. We see more like you know, there's a lot of hype around North American mining uh, of late. Like you're seeing big investments, Peter Thiel invested in um uh excess layer or, one layer one i think yeah uh -huh. yeah and a ton of money invested in there they're gonna build out some big firms i think in texas and, and abroad in north america uh there's gonna be a bigger investment into the oil and gas space in north america i'm sure um so you got it's not even though you know people have been fear-mongering about it being centralized in china um, you know, that has been true in the past. I don't think it's gonna be true in the future. And, and, and regardless, even when it has been centralized, nobody had the balls to do a censorship, like denial of service attack on Bitcoin. You haven't, we haven't seen anybody, you know, censor other miners like, uh, Bitmain never went through with anything like that. Um, and I think the answer is because people want to mine honestly, because mining honestly, uh, is profitable. Um, and regardless, we should. I'm not worried about Bitmain attacking Bitcoin. I'm I'm worried about you know the state attacking Bitcoin. Yeah, which is essentially, I mean, effectively, what Bitcoin is about. It's separation from you know state, nation states, regimes, uh, central banks, and governments. I mean, this is the ultimate message. I think people need to understand what is Bitcoin really about. Can you can you want to comment a little bit? Like, what is the 
bigger vision of, of uh, like the bigger picture of Bitcoin uh, for, you know, for our, for our listeners in, from your perspective? Hmm. Well, I see, you know, I just see Bitcoin as a tool, right? Um, it's, it's obviously a money. Um, you know, you can argue that, you know, because it's a produce, I see it as a produce good, right? Like the produced in the sense that, you know, work is employed to produce a product and that product is, is confirmations. Miners are producing confirmations for the network and, and the like. But, um, I mean, I see it as a tool, um, to circumvent, um, well, let's just say censorship, right? And, and obviously we, we all talk about censor, censor resistance, censor minimization and trust minimization. Uh, I definitely see, uh, Bitcoin is indeed that, um, well, we, we talked about the mosque example in Iran, which is just a really interesting, um, whether or not they're just doing it purely speculative or, or just to get Bitcoin to conduct more trade. I don't know. Um, but we, we've seen like all the use cases we talk about and promote, um, you know, global payments, um, all these things in which circumvent traditional, um, let's call it censor, censorship layers, right? Even the creation of money is an entire, it's a, it's a, it's a system of censorship. Like money is created right now, like fiat money is created by effectively a, a few decision makers. They get to decide who gets the money. They discriminate against everybody else. Um, that's an amazing thing about Bitcoin. It doesn't discriminate against anybody. Yeah. If you wanna, if you wanna create the money, you wanna, you wanna do the work. You can do it. It's just do the proof of work, right? It's, it's. Yeah. So, I see it as a, I see it as a tool to fight. Um, if, uh, I guess the word would be seniorage. I don't even know if I say that word right. It's just a word I learned. Yeah. Learn or rent, rent sinking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, you know, like the, you know, the government wants to tax you. Um, and I'm not against taxes by any means. Like, uh, I am and I'm, I am and I'm not. I mean, it, it sort of depends, but I'm against hidden inflationary tax. Absolutely. Um, and it, it, it destroys, like it competes and destroys that, uh, that tool that they have to use law and violence to extract wealth. It competes yeah. with that. It gives an alternative. And right. so I, I do see the only, the, only, uh, the only group that is negatively impacted by Bitcoin are those who are positively impacted by um, these, uh, uh, these tools of, of you know, mm -hmm. it's like tax, uh, inflation. So central bankers, uh, government, big government is hurt. Uh, big government will have to shrink um, if something like Bitcoin uh, is widely adopted. Um, basically, any anyone against free market competition is going to get hurt by Bitcoin. Yeah, uh, these are topics that yeah I'm going to discuss more and more with uh, Eric Rasquil. By the way, Eric Rasquil, um, who is uh, um, organizing or one of the main organizers of the Crypto Economic Conference 2020 in Hanoi, Vietnam, and you are invited as one of the you know main speakers. Um, yeah. what, what is your role over there? I mean, what's your topic? Is, it, is that what you're going to talk about? Yeah, I still got to work on what exactly I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about, yeah, right now, uh, generally, uh, just like decentralized mining, which is, you know, something that we do as a business, uh, just by nature, but it's also a topic like, you know, I've already touched on a lot of points uh, that relate to that uh, here today, but, um, I think it's a very important topic. It's, it's sort of a, uh, you know, I'm going to talk about how, you know, decentralization of mining is, you know, it, it happens in response to need, like not exactly. It, it's, it's a means to an end to like centralized mining is, is tends to be uh, more profitable, but it's also riskier, um, like more easy, easy to shut down and that kind of thing through censorship and, and the like. So I'm going to talk about certain things about that and, and how, uh, you know, the importance of being able to mine covertly. Um, like, for example, you know, I, I like to think about, you know, what the future holds, like, like all of us, and what I've said about the future of mining and, and, you know, the future of black market mining, the people mining covertly with these small devices, they'll, they'll just steal your power if you leave it unattended um, with these throwaway devices. 
Um, I, I see that happening. Um, but yeah, no, I'm really excited for this conference. Uh, like Eric, Eric is, uh, I would say he's influenced me the most in the space. Like, mm -hmm. uh, his work on, and it's not just him, there's other contributors, obviously. Um, but uh, like he's, he's a contributor to, to the Le Bitcoin project, but on that project, like for those who aren't familiar with it, um, there's a whole, uh, sort of like a wiki. Uh, he writes articles and there's other contributors, but he writes articles um, um, on crypto economics, basically. Right. Um, sort and of, for those listeners who don't know him or have never heard of him is he writes, I mean, he's, he's, he is truly the most rational uh, economist. He, he doesn't even call himself Austin economist. He says, you know, he's a rational Bitcoin and rational economist. So just for, Right yeah, there. I think that's a good description. I, he, I think he, uh, he, like his work and I'm not, I'm not an economist and I haven't studied the Austrian school. I just hear people, it just resonates with me. Like all the Austrians that I meet have the same ideas I have. So it, that, that school of thought resonates with me and Eric's, Eric's more than anyone. Um, cause yeah, I, I agree. He's put out some of the most rational discourse on, all kinds of topics. And I think there's a lot of really good topics on that wiki. They're usually short reads and they are very concise yeah. and clear. And I, I read them all the time. Actually. Yeah, which you got to read like uh, a couple of times till you, I mean, from, from, yeah. from you know, like, <laughs> until I yeah, can digest it because it's so line. succinct, you know? <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. And I mean, that's influenced me a lot. And, uh, and I've always been a big promoter of Eric's work because I, when I see stuff that, I agree with, I try to propagate it as much as I can, especially because a lot of his work, a lot of that work on that, on that site and the articles, they talk about a lot of misconceptions. He sort of debunks a lot of misconceptions. There's a bunch of fallacies, articles he has there. I think they're widely underappreciated. Like I, there's a, f I see other people, uh, you know, promoting it more and more over time, but they're widely underappreciated as far as I'm concerned. Um, there's, it just completely debunks certain really dumb ideas like proof of stake and, and some other, uh, there's plenty and plenty of examples, but so yeah, the, the crypto econ conference, Eric asked me to speak, uh, which I was very happy, um, to be invited. So we're going to fly halfway around the world and to Vietnam. Um, that's right. February 28th to March 3rd. I really think this is going to be an outstanding conference. It's going to be smaller. It's not, you know, it's not like, uh, it's not going to have the hype and stuff of like Bitcoin 2020 or consensus or something, but right. I think the quality of this conference is to be outstanding. Um, and the, and the, I, would, I would definitely recommend anybody who's yeah, any, I'd love any to come. I'd love, out there yeah. sitting on your, your hordes of money, like dump exactly. some of that Bitcoin and get over here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean the, the guests, I mean, with you and, and so many other, uh, uh, you know, high caliber uh, Bitcoin brains uh, and, and, and knowledgeable people like uh, I don't know who, who's coming out Jack Mallers and it's just so many people yeah Alina Satoshi uh, that... Tom Pascia there's a lot of a lot of great people there mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well I'll try to come if I find a sponsor I'll definitely come because I want to make like personal interviews that would be awesome for highest quality but well, let's see well that's awesome um, so Anything else uh, to wrap this up? I mean, is there anything you wanna you wanna add, like um, information that people should know, where to follow you, or um, besides your Twitter um, and website? And uh, yeah, just follow me. Uh, you should follow me on Twitter. Um, I try to. I, I have a lot of shit posts, but I like to be rational. So I like to think rationally. I'm, and I'm I'm looking to learn too. Like. Um, I, over time, like I, I've learned a lot through just the great people that, you know, you'll meet on Twitter. So, um, yeah, follow me there. Uh, that's probably the best. I, I'm on Twitter all the time. I spend way too much time on it. It's sad, but I don't, <laughs> it's like the only outlet I have aside from working. So it's, uh, and, and the, my, per, and my personal life with my wife and my dog, but, uh, follow me there. Um, I'm pretty open. Like I, I'm, I have less time for uh, people as I used to, but usually when, you know, when people contact me and want more information on what we do or just in mining in general and, and that kind of thing, I, I'm usually pretty open to 
at least uh, reply and stuff like that. So yeah, no, that's, that's probably the best place to contact me. Anything on the horizon, like on the roadmap that um, we should look, look out for, or um, what do you see? Like, the next few years we want to like any give any projections or whatever <laughs> like uh like for bitcoin in general yeah for, in general like, at bitcoin or you know or in connection with upstream data uh well with my company i got some really cool new products um now they're mostly focused on oil field we got some i do try to like i got a few products already like a product like the small data centers we do that i am trying to get into the traditional mining space and especially like the commercial smaller side of it mm -hmm. um not just the big stuff but we have a lot of cool big stuff coming uh just cool oil field products coming um but that'll all be shown and announced as soon as i can um as far as the future i mean i'm uh i'm as i'm as big a bull as you'll you'll ever meet uh i think um i don't know uh i don't i certainly won't venture to do a price prediction but i think things are, are going to be really great here in 2020 or 20 in the 2020s i don't know what 2020 will hold the having is going to be fun but um a lot of good will be in store for bitcoin that's for sure right do you think like the critical adoption rate and the accessibility you know the use of friendliness um is going to accelerate in the next few years oh yeah 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 definitely i mean uh well, you know, base layer stuff is, is a challenge because um, mm -hmm. you certainly, you can't compromise certain aspects of the base layer. And that'll probably always remain some degree, but, you know, it's not, it'll probably never be as simple as just calling Visa and getting a, a Visa card and that's it, like payment system, right? But Bitcoin is so much more than that, so it, it can't be that anyway. Uh, so um, I think the layering is going to get better and better. Uh, the layer twos, like not just not just Lightning, like non-custodial layer twos, which and I think Lightning is going to be uh, just going to get more and more adoption. It's going to be a big part of Bitcoin's future, I think. Lightning and probably who knows, like other similar layer two layers uh, that people find maybe better ways or other ways to do it. But then there's even even the custodial layers. I think will get better and better um, over time. But it's not all upside. There's there's risk of uh, you know, Bitcoin anticipates uh, the state uh, state intervention and state, you know, the state trying to come in. Like, you know, some some things I'm worried about or I think could very well happen within the 2020s, uh, probably will happen in the 2020s, is, is, is things like the requirement for licenses to mine Bitcoin and stuff like that um, in certain jurisdictions. Um, sort of like there's already, you need a license to go produce oil. And so I think, you need a license to go produce gold. Mm -hmm. So I think you're going to see the same kind of thing in Bitcoin. It's just going to be much, much harder uh, to, for them to actually regulate, but it's not necessarily bad for Bitcoin. It's bad. It would be bad for white market miners like myself. Um, black market, black market miners are going to love that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Which, you know, eventually at the end of the day, isn't Bitcoin really, um, you know, a mass, black market money for billions of people, uh, you know, to circumvent this, uh, you know, the, the, um, the, the, the aggressions and the violence and the, the oppression and, you know, the unjust uh, things that are going on, uh, you know, in, with, you know, nationally, supranationally. Isn't that what Bitcoin is all about? Like, uh, freedom? <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's accurate to say that. What I like to say it, because the problem or a problem with describing it as black market money, which I totally agree with, it is, it is that, um, is that people have a misconception on what black market means and they think it's like evil. They think it's bad when in fact it's really, we're talking about free market and captive market, right? Black market is free market. White market is captive market. So I look at it as free market money. Um, and that's nothing, you know, it's going to be difficult to shut it down. It's going to be difficult to, to restrain it. Um, cause the, the forces that be that want to do that, they don't know how to compete. They've never competed in, in right. their existence. They use, they use violence. Right. So, right. so, yeah. 
awesome talk. Uh, really, uh, really enjoyed it, uh, Steve. And yeah, hope um, to get you back soon on maybe on a panel discussion. Uh, really, um, um, hopefully we'll see each other in Hanoi, Vietnam. I'll try to make it if I find a sponsor. And um, yeah, um, thanks so much for your time and talk to you soon. Yeah. yeah, no, I hope to meet you there, see you there as well. Um, and everyone listening, um, definitely go on the website and check it out. But yeah, no, thanks for having me, uh, Kevin. I appreciate it very much. So, how'd you guys like this? Awesome, fat, fantastic interview. Um, I really learned a lot. I enjoyed it. Uh, this is what, you know, I think the bigger vision, understanding, comparing the bigger vision, uh, you know, the bigger intention uh, behind all these, you know, structures that are evolving so fast. Uh, what else, I mean, is better than, than you know, uh, we, you got natural resources, uh, you know, gas, what do we call it? Vented, flared, stranded gas that is there. I mean, why not use it? Why not, instead of burning it, uh, you know, convert it, transmute it, transform it into energy and mine Bitcoin with it and make something use, useful. You know, there's a lot, so much talk about, you know, climate this, climate that, hysteria, propaganda. So anyway, if you love this talk with Steve Barber as much as I did, please, leave a positive review on any podcast platform. Uh, if you want to help me in any shape or form, you know, go on Twitter, give me a follow, get, go on YouTube, which I'm going to upload it to on any podcast platform I have. Um, send me an email to kd at kvandavani.com or short hello at the total Uh Thank you so much for your support. Thanks so much for listening and share, retweet, repost, whatever you can do, just, you know, spread uh, this and distribute this, this knowledge, this information and uh, the content that I produce, um, which I put a lot of time and effort into this, uh, which I love doing. And I want to, you know, uh, go, you know, to conferences. If you, you know, help, can help me in any shape or form with any Satoshis, uh, I would really appreciate it so I can go to all these Bitcoin conferences with in Hanoi in San Francisco to the Bitcoin conference or um, any place in this world and do, you know, highest quality uh, uh, interviews face to face, um, whether it be video and or audio and, you know, deliver you highest quality content uh, and knowledge and ethos and uh, monetary evolution. And that's Bitcoin. Well, thank you so much. My name is Kevin Devani. I'm the Total Connector, and thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Total Bitcoin Podcast. Have a good day. Bye.